everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, The Three Pillars to Successful ESOL Remote Instruction. Today's webinar is generously sponsored by Burlington English, and we're hoping to have Robert Breitbart on the line with us maybe towards the end of the presentation. Um, but in the meantime, I just want to thank Burlington English and Robert for sponsoring today's webinar. Um, we definitely would not be able to put these on for our members if it wasn't for partners like them, so we are grateful. Um, our presenter today is Kate Anderson. She has been identified in the field of adult education for the past 15 years, serving in many roles, including co community planner, instructor, and program director. Currently, Kate is a member of the statewide SABES professional development team, working to bring high-quality ESOL PD to the field of adult education in Massachusetts. With an MED in Instructional design, Kate has been in the trenches creating programs to successfully design and deliver effective remote instruction for ESOL learners. And with that, I see Robert just jumped on, so I'm going to turn it over to him to say a couple of words. Robert, welcome. You're muted. Thank you, friends. Thank you, James. Thank you to Kate and everybody joining in. Really appreciate it. Uh, about a round of applause for James saving the day there. Thank you ever so much. Well, everybody, we're super excited. Uh, so many years now, uh, partnering with our great friends at CoAbe to bring you these um, bring you these great uh, webinars. So uh, sit back. I know you're going to have a, a great one today. And obviously, this is one of our uh, most favorite topics, uh, being with with ESL and being remote. Uh, it's great to be out in the field and hear so many folks. Uh, I'm in the Iowa State Conference right now. And so many friends saying, Robert, without Burlington English, we, we really been, would have been really big in time in a jam. So uh, for today, as many of you know, with Burlington English, it's anytime, anywhere, seamless learning, uh, what I like to call every model learning. So whether uh, you as a teacher, whether you're back on site in the classroom, or if you're uh, conducting classes remotely, uh, or if you're doing uh, some kind of combination uh, of the two, uh, the great thing is, is Burlington English provides you with everything you need for projectable lessons, a year's worth of projectable lessons for every level of adult ESL. Once again, up on the whiteboard or filling your Zoom screen. And I, I love all the creative things we're seeing now with uh, things like BlendFlex. So where I have some of my students online, I have some of my students uh, on site with me. And once again, the great thing is that same Burlington English in-class projectable lesson fills your screens, regardless of what modality you're using. And then, of course, you know, one of the great research proven things that we can get our students doing uh, on their own learning, uh, asynchronous, guided uh, by us. And, and as you can see on the screen, the same great, uh, same great lesson format, same topics and everything that I've worked with my students uh, live synchronously is what they're gonna be doing asynchronously on their own. And as you know, Burlington English, gosh, we've got 95% more content than when I first started uh, as one of the first uh, educators to use Burlington English. So regardless of whether it's core or career exploration, English for specific careers, digital literacy, exam preparation, high, high interest readers, uh, everything's there for you. So uh, please reach out. Oh, and a brand new grammar course included in everything that you get from Burlington English. So we'd love to hear from you. So please reach out to us, find your local representative at burlingtonenglish.com. And uh, I know I'm gonna sit back and uh, relax and enjoy this great webinar. Way to go, Kate, and turn it back over to James. Thank you, friends. All right, Robert, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad you were able to join. Um, and thank you again, face-to-face -face for your sponsorship of today's webinar. We appreciate it. We're grateful. Um, and with that, I see a bunch of people are already uh, entering the chat where they're calling in from today. If you haven't done so, feel free to drop your name and where you're calling in from. If you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to submit those in the Q&A box. And Kate will get to those towards the end of her presentation. And with that, I will hand it over to her. Thank you very much. Wonderful. I've already learned something new from Robert today. Um, I've never heard of blend flex. Um, I've heard of a very similar type of thing called high flex, but blend flex that it just goes to show how quickly things are changing and evolving um, in the world of online learning. So um, 
I'm very excited to be here. I'm going to share my screen. I do have a little um, slideshow to share. And uh, I am so amazed at all of the different um, areas of the country represented. So I will start with good day. Uh, we have morning, afternoon represented here. So uh, again, I want to um, say good day to everybody and that we're here to discuss how as teachers, we can really create that space online that are going to, that's going to engage our learners and provide a platform for rigorous instruction and warm welcoming space, I think is something that we're all really interested in as well um, for you and your students. And I want to talk a bit too about how we do this before your students have ever entered your classroom. So that's sort of what we're going to be looking at today. Um, thank you so much, James, for that introduction. Um, he covered a lot of what I was going to cover um, in my little introduction here. Um, and you may wonder why we're looking at the back end of the car. And this is actually a funny game that my kids and I have done for years, um, just going by what's on the back of, of um, on bumper stickers, what people will have on the back of their bumper stickers. So as we're driving down the road, we'll say to each other, if there's one thing you ought to know about me, it's that you know, I'm a dog mom, or I like Bruce Springsteen, or so I decided to use my professional introduction um, via bumper sticker. And you're welcome to put in chat, you know, what you would um, include on your bumper sticker if you were to want somebody driving down the road to know one thing about you. Um, so I work at the ESOL PD Center in the state of Massachusetts um, in the professional development arm called SABES, um, which stands for, um, system for adult basic ed support. So ESL is one of five centers. I, I work in the ESL. I've been in the field for about 15 years, as James mentioned, from community planner to director to learn at work program manager. And now I'm working in professional development. So that story may be similar, um, familiar to a lot of you as adult ed rarely has a straight line into the field. Um, but usually once we get here, we stay here. <laughs> Um, I'm a strong advocate for online learning. I think it brings a lot of equity and access to, to education. So um, that's something I would want people to know about me. Um, and I love talking with people about how to create a successful um, online learning opportunity for their learners. And I'm really happy to be here today. You're going to notice me. Um, checking notes because I do tend to head down rabbit holes. Um, this is a topic about which I'm very passionate and I'm very excited about. Um, this was also a presentation I had done that was twice the length, that was 90 minutes. Um, so I've cut, cut, cut. So I have to you know, remember not to like head down the rabbit hole. So I will be checking uh, my notes as I go through as we talk today. Um, so that is me in a nutshell. Um, just a little housekeeping, feel free to step away as you need to, um, you know, just mute and shut down your camera or um, actually as this is a webinar format, I, I believe cameras may be off. Um, type any questions that you might have into the Q&A feature um, or you can feel free to raise your hand and I will do my best um, to uh, to respond as quickly as I can. And again, as you're on mute, I believe, excuse me, as we're on a webinar, I believe that James does have us on mute, but if you are not, it's just easier if you stay on mute to, um, you know, reduce any of that excess noise. Um, and hi, Kate. Yes. Uh, we're seeing still the presenter view instead of the presentation, just the slides aren't advancing. I appreciate that. One moment, how funny. Well, not really. There we go. Is that better? Uh, now we see the housekeeping. Yes. Okay. I apologize for that. I appreciate you letting me know. That would have been terribly dull to watch <laughs> that one slide through my whole talk. Thank you. Um, so, okay. So those are our little housekeeping items. Um, so I guess I, I'm going to just jump in with, with starting at looking about some of the challenges that we experience in remote education um, and online learning. And I think that we all experienced sort of that baptism by fire a couple of years ago <clears throat> um, with that, with that you know, jolting transition to remote um, instruction. And so some of the challenges that we faced and that we still do face, I don't want to put it in past tense because I think these are ongoing challenges that we have, but a lot of people, you know, as they, they start to look at delivering online or remote instruction, where do I start? Um, overcoming those 
technology access issues with students and staff um, that are necessary. Um, and beyond access, many who are not entirely comfortable using the technology to teach and learn with it. Uh, we've had the inability to communicate effectively with students, which I think has been a real challenge and an ongoing challenge for us. And student persistent in attendance was affected more so initially. I, th I think we're getting the hang of it here, but I think that those were some of the concerns that, um, that programs and teachers uh, I know I was having um, in our work. And that loss of sense of community I think is a really um, was a really big concern and continues to be a concern. How do we right take this um, online environment that can seem sterile and we all look like talking heads and make that into something that is warm and inviting um, and where we have authentic opportunities to interact. So I think those were some of the concerns, you know, that we had and some of the potential pitfalls. There's been a lot of research, as you can imagine, um, that was happening prior to the pandemic, but certainly since the pandemic um, came down upon us, um, all oh, those short couple of years ago, um, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of research kind of looking into these same kinds of things, and it really affirms our own experiences in the field. And and I'm in touch with instructional staff daily in my work with professional development, um, and keep my ear to the ground about kind of what these challenges and and pitfalls are. So I feel as though the research does affirm what we've been learning about that in terms of identifying these three top areas being access to technology. And this is really a big one, as we all know. Um, I know in Massachusetts for the first 18 months of the pandemic, we really were looking at um, 80 to 90% of our ESL students participating in their course time on a phone. Um, and that was really challenging. Uh, the system has since kind of clicked into gear here and we're looking at a lot more people having access to technology like, you know, the Kindle Fire or the Google Chromebooks or, or those kinds of things. So, so we are accessing technology more readily now, but that was such a huge um, um, obstacle to overcome, especially initially still to, uh, to some now. You know, the best lessons in the world um, aren't going to have an impact if they're not accessible to our learners. Uh, the learning curve with technology um, and this is really a big one. I, I don't know if some of you may have heard of the term, keep it simple, uh, sweet and simple. Uh, and that is so true. I think that many of us thought, oh, I'm moving to this online environment. Oh my gosh, I must pull out every tool that I've ever heard of to make this instruction engaging and effective. And, and how am I gonna learn all of this? And how am I gonna teach my students? And, and that was really um, a terrifying thought for a lot of us. And so I really have a mantra that is one or two tried and true tools. That's really what you need. Um, get familiar with those tools, be comfortable with those tools and, and, and eliminate this learning curve. With one or two tools, you're perfectly um, able to provide effective, engaging online instruction. And finally, the one that I've heard about probably more um, and that this, the research um, affirms again is that loss of sense of community. We're not in the same room together. We are in this kind of, um, some may look at as an artificial setting, although I've gotten very comfortable seeing all of you here now um, in, in, this, um, in this setting. But honestly, um, this is where our job gets really challenging in terms of how do you as the instructor lead the class to that place of comfort in this remote setting and how do you create your online presence? And so this is really the crux of what I want us to talk about today. Um, how do we um, as educational leaders make sure that we're not losing our students in this environment that we find ourselves now? So our goals for today are really just to take a look at some common terms and provide some general definitions. Uh, as I said at the beginning, blend flex was new for me. Um, I've heard that referenced as high flex. And so you can see the terminology is changing and, and morphing as, as we speak. And so I wanna look at some of the common terms just so we have that sort of baseline as we're talking. I also wanna introduce this idea of um, community of learning. Um, of community and the idea of community of inquiry and the role that it plays in instruction and what does this mean and what does it look like, this community of inquiry that we want to establish in our courses. 
Um, we're going to look at these three overarching pillars that I had identified in the title of the session um, that I think really provide a framework for successful remote instruction. And we're going to provide some practical tips and tools for incorporating these three pillars into your instructional um, practice and planning. So those are the goals for today. So I just want to start with some general definitions. And I think that we've all talked a bit about remote instruction. Um, there are many tools that are used in discussion of remote instruction and remote delivery. So I think it would be helpful just to clarify a few of these definitions. Um, they come from the research, my own experience, instructional design text, peer reviewed journals. Um, so I've tried to kind of grab those elements of remote instructional um, definitions that, that um, work together to provide the definition that it's really teaching that occurs when students um, and the teachers are not in the same physical location. And that really is the key. Um, it can include synchronous or asynchronous learning activities. So synchronous sessions such as we're doing right now. So we're all here together. Um, this, this could be considered a remote opportunity or asynchronous learning activities, um, which is a self-paced, more self-paced content. Um, you know, recorded lessons, videos, at reading and articles, those kinds of things that happen outside of, of the structured class time together. Um, and generally, it really entails adjusting content designed for in-person delivery to that online platform. And that's one of the biggest, um, in, my, in the field of instructional design, that's one of the biggest distinction that's made. Um, I have taken a lot of online courses in the past, and those courses are designed as online courses. So the content is, is intended for online courses. The, the, um, the structure, the syllabus, all of those things are intended to be online and intentionally delivered online. I think what we have found ourselves doing in remote instruction is taking those things, taking our syllabus, taking our curriculum, taking our uh, instructional best practices and turning that into um, adapting it for this remote or online delivery. And so I think for me, that's a, a, um, a big distinction to make. Um, but we then move to blended learning, which I think, um, and I'm curious to see what you all have to say when we get to um, that section in a minute. Um, but blended learning is really that deliberate mixture of online and face-to-face -face activities with that goal of stimulating learning. And, and so I always look at that as, um, you know, more of a structure, you can, you've heard it as hybrid or flipped classroom, those kinds of things also. So blended learning really allows you to um, provide those foundational materials, read an article, watch a film, um, complete a journal entry, and then come to class and we talk about that. So we're not, we're not going to watch the movie during class time, you're going to take care of that on your own time. And so when you come in, we're kind of hitting the ground running with the activities and the lessons built around that, that movie. Face-to-face -face is the method of delivering instruction that allows teachers and students to see one another during the course of instruction. And so we used to call our, all of our classes were face-to-face. -face. I'm looking at your face, you're looking at mine, we're face-to-face. -face. Um, and that has been one of the terms that has really changed over the course of the pandemic. And we now see in-person. So in-person, Anything face to face, excuse me, anything face to face is a Zoom session, is a WhatsApp meeting, is a Google Hangout, is a Skype, is a whatever, a one of a million different um, video conferencing tools really is face to face. So if we can see each other and interact, that's face to face. In person now is when the student and the teacher are in that same space um, during the time of instruction. And so making these distinctions now. Um, is a little trickier than it used to be. And I caution you that they change all the time. <laughs> so there, we're, we're still in that, that time of, of development and change in terms of the definitions. So one of the things that I wanna talk about um, with each of these modalities is although they have a different um, delivery, they all we're all looking at this through the lens of having a successful learning outcome for our students. We're looking um, 
our intent is always that supporting learning and developing that community of inquiry that I mentioned earlier that I'm going to talk a little bit about now, where we're going to take a closer look at that concept that integrates all of these elements um, present in any classroom setting or that we hope. So there's been a great deal of research conducted um, to help us define a community of inquiry and online presence within the context of remote instruction. And there was one study, I, so I, I did go through a lot of different studies and tried to pull those um, that I thought were, were um, the most pertinent to our conversation today. And one study conducted by the Journal of Computer Assisted Living defines online presence as the instructor's design, facilitation, and direction of cognitive and social processes to realize personally meaningful and educationally worthwhile learning outcomes. And so that sounds very academic, but I think once you tease it apart, you see what it's getting at, that it's really design, facilitation, and direction, um, you know, that, that's going to provide that successful outcome for our students. A second definition, which talks a little bit more about a community of inquiry, which is what we're all striving for, um, is the Journal of Education Online discusses that it's a remote or blended course experience within the context of developing this community of inquiry and is really led by the instructor. So that's us, we're, we're in charge of, of leading this charge. Um, and the development of well-structured lessons, the appropriate to the classroom environment, the sharing of our own social presence, um, basically being your own amazing self. I, I so often people, I'll talk with somebody in person um, and they're, they're wonderful and gregarious and outgoing and knowledgeable and I'll see them online and you're thinking, who are you? Didn't I meet you? And, and where, where are you? Bring that person to the, the online environment also. So I think that's really important. Sometimes people feel a little stunted and um, deer in the headlights when they're, they're in this kind of, of setting. And I know it's very hard, I'll tell you, um, that I've hidden myself on the cam <laughs> my camera, um, because it's very disconcerting to present and watch yourself. You're looking at yourself all the time and it's very unsettling. Um, so I, I think that you just bring that amazing self to these sessions and that's gonna really help your students do the same. You know, supporting the students and creating and sharing their social presence is part of our role as well. So we have to kind of put ourselves out there, show them it's okay, help them know that they're gonna be comfortable. Um, and this is really what we're striving for in all of our classrooms. And so as teachers, we lead our classes by displaying that cognitive presence by way of those well-structured lessons, the social presence with excellent communication, the creation of that environment that's really conducive to learning. This is how we all want to learn. We all want to be comfortable. We all want to be ourselves. We all want to be open. We all want to know what's coming. Um, and that teaching presence by being prepared to share yourself and support our stu students in learning and connecting. And I think that we're talking about a remote setting today, but this is what we would do in an in-person setting as well. So you'll notice that a lot of these skills are interchangeable, but some of them you just have to be more aware of um, in this online environment. So that all sounds fine, but what is that gonna look like when we're talking, um, when we're looking at our remote courses? How, how do we make this happen? Um, and so I really think that in creating that community of inquiry where you can achieve those authentic and successful learning outcomes, it provides us that opportunity to um, examine the um, instruction within this remote context of the three pillars of structure, communication, and delivery of, of content. And I think that this was something that I really, um, had been working on prior to the pandemic coming as I work with instructors who are kind of figuring out how they get themselves comfortable in this environment. I think we all saw um, some level of this coming. We certainly didn't see um, this, this um, transition to be quite as uh, dramatic as it was, I guess is the term that I'll use. But most of us saw that in the future, we were going to be doing more and more online. And so some teachers were really looking at, how am I going to do this? And what is this going to look like and feel like for me? Um, and so I, I was really trying to develop, again, looking at all of the research, this is nothing that is like magical or stupendous that I developed on my own. Um, but it was just looking at that research and what are what are the buckets of, of um, 
knowledge that will help people to move forward. And so by structuring and communicating and delivering your courses and keeping that in mind as you're, as you're throughout your planning process is very helpful. So I want to just take a look. We're going to get more in detail about this, but just so that you're, you're thinking about the types of things that I'm talking about when I'm looking at structure. Um, Remember when I was I was talking earlier and I was talking about things that we're going to be doing before your students even come into the classroom. Um, and you do that by really structuring your course to ensure that they're clear on the expectations and format from the start. So your students will be comfortable entering that classroom um, and you're going to provide them with this structure for your course. So how is your course going to be organized? So important to be thinking about this before class has begun. Um, do you plan on using synchronous sessions? And how are you going to use those? Are they going to be mandatory? Will they be recorded? Um, how will your program attendance policy impact these decisions? That was a really big question, um, you know, that we had at the very, very beginning of the pandemic was how do we track attendance on these um, synchronous sessions? And how do we track asynchronous components as well. And so that was something that was um, that you really have to consider as you're structuring your course. Will there be asynchronous components of the course at all? Will you be asking students to do work in between class? And I think that's where we go back to also, um, you know, that courses used to, we could meet six or nine hours a week. Well, you're not going to meet that often in Zoom. So how do you, or in, in other um, synchronous delivery methods? So, you know, how does that work? Um, how, how do you figure this out? And are you going to plan it by thematic unit? Um, are you going to decide, are you deciding to go by your class schedule so that you have fall, winter, spring, summer, um, semesters? Uh, you know, there, there are all kinds of considerations that you wanted to think about as you're um, working through how you want to structure your class. But we're going to get into a little more detail about that in just a minute. Um, communication is also um very important obviously um it's really one of the key elements that we've identified here and how are you going to communicate with your students how often should they expect to hear from you um, how would you like them to communicate with you now that you're not in a classroom with them or you may not be in a classroom with them as often and how quickly can they expect to hear back from you so we're going to talk in a minute about developing a communication plan um, that you'll lay out at the very beginning of, of your classes with students so that they're very clear on all of this information. And finally, we're going to look at delivery. Um, and again, going back to will it be synchronous? Um, is it going to be asynchronous? What elements will you use? Google Docs and Drive or email, something else, a combination? Um, how often do you plan to meet? Will you require video, leave video optional, which has been another big issue that we've kind of looked at over um, the last couple of years is, is the equity and accessibility issues that are brought up with um, the use of video. Um, how do you do a check-in with set? Where are you planning to do a check-in with students each session? And at the beginning, this was really, really important. Obviously, we had a lot of students in crisis at the beginning of the pandemic. And so setting aside that class time to really check in and see um, how students were doing and, and what types of things they were in need of um, was very important. Um, so it's really all about, you know, delivery, um, structure, uh, excuse me, structure, communication, delivery is really all about the tone you're going to set um, in working with your students. And so people are feeling like, okay, that makes sense. I like this. So what can you do to achieve these goals of, of setting out a clear structure, a thorough communication plan and delivering your content in a way that um, students will find it useful and um, you're able to create that online presence and that community of inquiry in your classroom? How do, how do you achieve that goal? We're going to just talk a little bit more um, about structure, and this is where we're going to dig a little bit deeper. And at the end of this little section, we're going to have a chance to ask questions. I see there's some questions in chat um, and in the Q and A. Um, and so I just I want to take a look very first before we do that, just at structure and what I'm talking about when we're talking about structure. Uh, 
Um, and some of you may look at this and say, really, I've set aside my afternoon here on Wednesday or my morning <laughs> to talk about creating a syllabus. And so my answer is yes. Um, I think that uh, this is really the best way to provide structure in your classes is by providing a, a, a syllabus for your students. Um, there are two camps that I work uh, I work with with instructors. Um, and we have hundreds of ESOL instructors here in Massachusetts. And I find that there are instructors and programs that use a, a syllabus militantly. That is the way they structure their courses. Everybody has a syllabus. Um, they're, they're pretty much in lockstep with one another throughout the levels of class and the program itself. And then there are those programs who don't use them at all. And that's perfectly fine. And that's not to say that their courses aren't laid out beautifully and that their, um, their curriculum isn't wonderful and that their thematic units aren't, aren't ideal and, and that students aren't getting a lot out of their class. But what I do um, when I'm talking with programs, what I will say is that there's a piece missing. There's a, um, the loop is not closed. You know, the, there's a link in that chain that's not there. And that's closing that loop with letting students know where they are, you know, what, what is going on? Wh where are we going? Um, and in the event of missing a, a session, what did I miss? Um, and so I think that that's really, really important. And I always look at, uh, as an adult learner myself, um, how important that is to me, how the first thing I look at when I take a course is a syllabus so that I can see what's going on. What am I gonna be reading? What am I gonna be seeing? Lay out my semester of work. How is this, how does this fit in with my life? When can I do this? You know, it's, it's so important. And so I think um, that's an important element to add for our students. So, Um, I, I think, too, that it's also almost more important now that we provide this level of structure and this level of kind of dependability in a world where ambiguity is so constant, <laughs> um, where things are not, are not um, definite and well-defined. I think it's helpful for our students to know, here's my class. I'm holding it in my hands. I have a map to the semester, to the to the. Um, you know, the season to this unit in my hand. And I just think that that's really helpful. Um, you're really beginning to, to create your online presence with your students and setting that tone for your time together, again, before you ever start teaching. And they can take many forms. Um, this does not have to be a hugely formal document. Um, as we're preparing our students for college and career readiness, it's a good thing for them to know the word syllabus. It's a good thing for them to um, take that responsibility for their learning as we're looking at gradual, um, you know, release of responsibility for learning and those types of things that we're looking at in adult education. But it's a very valuable tool. Um, when you're some just basic, basic guidelines about using a syllabus is you really want to use understandable and welcoming language. And as we work with our ESOL students, you know how important this is. Um, you know, we need to make sure they're understanding. So you want to make sure that that all of your content and all the materials in your syllabus is at an appropriate level and that it's welcoming, that they, they understand the purpose of the syllabus um, and that it's really for them as well as you in terms of a planning tool. You really wanna lay out how the course is gonna progress during that designated period. You can lay it out by weeks, you can lay it out by days, you can lay it out by um, projects, any way you wanna lay it out is really helpful just to give the students a sense of, of where they're going. You wanna clarify means of communication, which again, we're gonna talk about in, in the second pillar, um, but that communication plan is really important and it's really useful to include that communication plan here in the syllabus as well. And really it's just an opportunity again to share that enthusiasm, to um, share yourself, to share your passion for teaching and learning and infuse that into your, um, to your syllabus as well. The syllabus is really useful too. You can send it to them. Uh, you can 
have it be your first couple of sessions together as a lesson. Um, you can email it or send it ahead of time via WhatsApp or your text chain or however you choose to communicate with students. It can be part of your orientation process before students start actually start classes um, so that everybody's singing off of that same sheet of music before you get started. Or it can even be part, and I've, I've talked with a couple of programs that will use their syllabus as part of their registration process so that students are well aware of what the expectations are before they sign on that dotted line and say, yep, I wanna be part of this class. They see what the expectations are. So I just wanna say a word about words. <clears throat> and this is really an interesting um, demonstration of the power of words. And as educators, I think that we are perhaps more sensitive to this um, than anybody else. I, I'd like to think so, that we're careful of, of what we say and how we say it because we realize how important that is. Um, and I took a workshop um, at the community college that I used to work at um, from this really fabulous professor. And she was really uh, dedicated to equity and access and um, um, creating a really student-centered environment in her classroom. And so she did a session about creating that student-centered um, syllabus and, and how you do that. And so she included a couple of examples for us to kind of read through. And if we're thinking through the lens of, I wanna create this welcoming environment for our students and for our learners, um, you know, she gave us these two examples that you see in front of you. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a second to read them if you haven't done so already. And tell us, tell me, you know, think to yourself, which one you think is the most welcoming of the two and what makes it the most welcoming? So I'm just gonna give you a couple of seconds there to read through. Great, the first one. Yeah, thank you, I'm seeing because of the word welcome, absolutely. And that's so, it's, um, it seems so, obvious, like, well, of course, that's what it is. Um, but that really is it. I welcome you. Instead of if you need to contact me outside of office hours, you're welcoming them to contact you. I have one more quick one. Um, and thank you so much for your contributions in chat. I appreciate that. So we just have these, this last one that I wanted you to take a quick peek at and tell me what you think. Which one would you find most welcoming as a student? Hey, first one wins again. Absolutely. Yes, this is the one that is more welcoming. And really, you should attend as opposed to I expect you to attend and recognizes that sometimes people are overextended and please come and see what we can do to discuss as opposed to, you know, I'm gonna drop you from the class roster in accordance with the college's attendance policy. And I think that that's really, if I were, um, if I were a student coming into a course and I read the unwelcoming on the right-hand side, I would be like, ooh, geez, this person isn't very warm and fuzzy. I, I'm a little concerned now, as opposed to the welcoming. So I just, I thought it was worth, and I thank you again for your contributions to the chat. I, I, I really think that it's so important to um, be mindful of, of um, you know, how we say things to people. And, and again, you know all of this, but I just thought these were some kind of, um, nice examples to show what a difference that can make and just that couple of extra seconds to, to take a look through. Um, a couple of other helpful fields to show are just how, how you're going to set it up. So if you're setting it up by thematic unit and these are the dates that you're going to use. Um, you can set it up any way you choose, as I mentioned. You don't want to be handing out a syllabus every week, um, but we know through the course of, I know in our programs here in Massachusetts, people step in and out of programs um, pretty frequently. So you'd like to chunk it out so that the materials are set, um, are set up that way. You'll also want to include your, your um, contact information, your contact preferences, um, 
about if, if you're going to hold virtual office hours on Monday directly after class. Um, time the students can come in and check in, ask questions, get extra help when you're in person. Oftentimes, I know when I was teaching, I'd try to get there a few minutes early, you know, 15 or 20 minutes early, so that students could pop in, ask a question, um, just check in and say hello, you know, be there to greet them as they arrived. And so it, are you planning to do that sort of thing still? Or can they, are they welcome to stay after class? Um, you know, you'll keep the Zoom room open for a few minutes so that they can ask their questions. Um, this is really, I, I think, important. Um, that you're clear about your availability during and after class. Um, and just also a little bit about how you would like them to contact you. If it's not before or after class, do you want them to email you or message you on WhatsApp anytime? Um, and give them a, um, parameters for which you'll reply, that you'll, re you'll reply within 24 to 48 hours or 12 to 24, whatever parameters you wanna set. I think it's really important. Um, that students just know that you'll get back to them as soon as you can. Um, things like I'm not going to reply on, on the weekend. I think that's a fair thing to put out there also, if that's something that you want to set with your students. Um, and so those are just a couple of fields that I think are helpful. And I know that you are all familiar with the syllabus, so I don't want to beat it um, to death here. Uh, but I think that it's just important to talk a bit about um, the, the, learn, the unit that you're gonna be working on and provide students with objectives um, and include the, the information that we've been talking about, you know, about course structure um, specifically and spell it all out for students using that appropriate language level for the students that you have for, for um, you know, for clarity for them. Be very specific about when you're going to be meeting. Um, what are the expectations for work outside of the class meeting time? Does it count as attendance if they're in the Zoom session or is there some other deliverable? I know some of our programs want a um, journal entry or they have some other um, means of, of taking attendance. It's not, if you attend Zoom, that's not um, all of the expectations for that week. So just being really clear on that. Um, are you recording the sessions and will students have availability to them afterward? So all of those kinds of things um, you want to really spell out in your course syllabus so students are very clear on what the, your expectations are of them and what their expectations can be of you. Additionally, what other structural considerations are you going to be using? Are you going to be using, um, you know, USA Learns? Are you going to be using Burlington English, Khan Academy? How are you going to integrate your textbook into your remote work? Um, what types of assignments are you going to be expecting and how, when, and how will those be turned in? Um, do you want them turned in via Google Doc or a, a, a picture, or something via WhatsApp or, um, or, or some other way? And what kinds of deadlines are you thinking about here? How many assignments and when are they due? So I think those are all important things that you can lay out for our adult learners who, as we know, have many, many other things going on in their lives. And this is a document that helps them to plan what's coming and helps you to plan as well. And I'm almost finished talking about syllabi. I think what's really helpful though is if you can sketch out each week of that unit um, and so that they can see at a glance what the plan is going to be. Um, it provides that clarity and places the student in the driver's seat for their learning, which I think is really important. Um, including images here is totally important, depending on the level you're working with. Um, they hold in their hand that roadmap to your course and what they're going to be doing. It's They hold in their hand the expectations about communication. Um, when class is meeting and via what platform and which assignments are due um, and how you'd like them submitted. So within this syllabus, it's everything they need to be successful um, in your class, just about everything, but it's a roadmap for success to your class. And this is just another sample of a, of a syllabus that I really, I like because I know some of you teaching lower level um, ESL may be looking at that prior one and thinking, what? I can't hand that out to my students. They would have no idea. So I think for lower level um, students, a syllabus is still a really functional tool. I think it's a really, um, of course, outline, whatever you wanna call it. Um, but I think it's a really functional tool. And so this one, um, 
shows it color coded. So for each day in a given week, what it is, how you're meeting. Are you meeting in, you know, via Zoom? Are you meeting in person? Um, what do you want students to bring with you on that day? They, do they have the portable whiteboard so that they can make notes and write and, and hold them up to the screen? Um, do you want them to have their notebook? Uh, was there homework from this past week you'd like them to be bringing with them? Um, what is the homework for that night and when is it due? So you can color code it as well so that they can you know, look to see. Again, this is a great place for any pictures that you might want to include. Um, if, if it will help provide clarity for your students. Um, so the syllabus is, again, does not have to be this totally formal thing. Um, and I really call it a, a syllabus as opposed to a roadmap or a course outline, mainly because um, of the emphasis on college and career readiness that, you know, a syllabus is what they're going to hear it called if they move ahead in their education. So we may as well start getting them familiar with that now. Um, and there are just a couple of other ways you can structure your classes. It doesn't all have to be, um, you know, it's, it's not all about Zoom, it's not all about um, that, but it can be, um, if you're gonna use Google Docs or Drive, if people are using Google Classroom, um, creating a website for their class. We have a, a several programs in the state that are doing that and students really love that. Uh, many of them use Google Sites. Uh, for that is another great way to structure your class. You can set up weekly folders in Google Drive that are really, really helpful. Um, so a student will know that their weekly content is located right in that folder. If they miss class, if they you know, um, need a link to an assignment again, if there was a video you wanted them to watch um, and you include it in a shared Google Drive um, folder for them, uh, that's a great way to structure the class and they know exactly where they can go to get any missed work or, or misplaced work or review any of the work that you want to include. And I, ca I caution you here too, as we talked about, you know, um, using uh, tools that you're familiar with as well, is to try to choose those, those tools that you're comfortable with. And this is going to allow you to be comfortable providing basic support. Um, to your students. So if you're familiar with Google Drive, use Google Drive. If Google Docs are something you're really comfortable with, um, if you like live binders, if you like whatever it is that you like that you're comfortable with, that you feel comfortable working with students on is what you can use as well. Um, I sometimes will encourage people to create little job aids, just little step-by-step um, um, -step instructions for students that sometimes are helpful. Um, so I would encourage you to, to create job aids so your students, again, have access to those and they can follow step by step with any of the tools that you're planning to use in your course. Um, and you can even create, if you do have create a few little job aids or direction sheets for your students, you can create a, another a separate tech folder in your Google Drive. So there are a lot of different ways that you can structure your course to allow for ease of access, on-demand access, um, and, and the supports that your students are gonna need to be successful in this environment. So these are just a couple of suggestions that I have for structuring your course. Um, are you thinking that you're doing these things already or that they would work or that they wouldn't work or any thoughts or questions that um, are coming to your mind? Um, And none of this is um, earth shattering <laughs> information. Um, but what I do hope it is, is useful and, and getting you thinking and um, getting those juices flowing as we head into August, which is hard to believe. Um, yeah, thank you, a good reminder. Exactly, that's, that's my hope is that these are just kind of, um, yeah, change of delivery platform is challenging right now with my service to students, absolutely. There's been a lot of change. <laughs> um, that is for sure. That is for sure. Thank you so much. I'm going to continue on our journey here, um, taking a look at the next pillar, um, which is communication. So communication um, is a biggie. Uh, and I do, 
I know I said I was done with syllabi. I was just kidding. I'm not. I'm going to say something more about it. Um, and that is, I just want to go back for a minute here. Um, as you met, remember, I talked about a communication plan as we were looking at structure. And the communication plan is just so important, um, especially in this remote environment. Um, it's a, it's already a challenge when we're working with our ESL students, correct? It's, you know, it's, it's challenging under the best of circumstances. And so I think creating um, this communication plan, the second pillar, um, really being clear is so important. Um, and again, the more specific, the better. And I know I mentioned virtual drop-in office hours before. Um, and I really think it's worth mentioning again here that that's just a really great time for, for you to set aside for students. I'm available an hour before or after class. I'm available, you know, Wednesdays from four to five, whatever it is. So students know that they have access to you at a specific time. That will also cut back on um, kind of in between communication. So I know it's sort of like, you know, when you have a meeting with your boss, right? You, if you know that it's scheduled for next Tuesday, you're not gonna email them with every little thing that comes up. Between then, you're gonna wait until Tuesday and kind of go through your whole list. So um, having those times set aside that students can plan to have access to is really helpful. And to re reiterate your contact preferences and your time frames for responding, again, super helpful so that they're clear um, that really the best way to reach me is via text and I'll get back to you by the end of business the next day, any of those kinds of things. Um, other items that you're gonna wanna consider is how you're gonna keep in touch. Um, I've mentioned WhatsApp a lot. Um, one of the strategies that we used um, in Massachusetts in our ESOL PD center is really helping people to kind of take a look at, at the, the tools that, not that we were recommending necessarily, but that we had a lot of positive feedback about that those of us in our PD center had experience with that we could help the field in terms of support. Um, and so WhatsApp was kind of one of those that because it translates into so many languages, because it's free if participants have access to Wi-Fi, um, which could be in any public place. Um, and which is what uh, many um, of our students, our ESL students use WhatsApp to communicate with their families around the world. Uh, so it was kind of one of those nice opportunities for students to already know what we were presenting them with. So here's WhatsApp and they were like, oh great. And they'd show us how to use it. So that was actually pretty nice. So if you're setting up a WhatsApp group, that's a fabulous thing. I'm, some of you have heard of remind.com. Some of you are texting, group emails work better. Um, or even phone calls. I mean, those things are all um, great ways to communicate. It's whatever you and your students decide. How often are you gonna plan to communicate? You know, once a week, twice a week, three times a week. Um, and I think that this is really important also. I, I call it poking people, <laughs> um, but I think especially in a remote environment, um, multiple pokes or touches a week are so helpful. Um, I, I think there is that, that feeling of disconnect that's inherent in this environment, um, and we can um, not eliminate it because that's just the way it is, um, but we can um, lessen that sense of disconnection um, by having them know that you can hear from me a couple of times a week. Um, and one of the things that I also liked about WhatsApp <laughs> and I don't work for WhatsApp, honestly, but they do have the ability to send out um, kind of one-time reminders. So you can schedule a reminder or a status update in WhatsApp so that it's an easy way for you to sit on Monday morning and schedule out your communication with your students ahead of time and it shoots right out to them. And so I think that that's really nice. They know they can count on hearing from you. Um, and yet you don't have to be a slave to your phone or to the computer in terms of, of getting those messages sent out. You can schedule them all ahead of time. So let's see, I, I think another thing that's really important in an online environment are setting rituals, um, scheduling things um, that your students can rely on, depend upon, and, you know, before, after, during every class. And so I really love the ritual of reaching out to students um, prior to each class. And it really helps support that connection. 
Um, and again, it's just it's just a little poke or a nudge or a reminder, whatever you want to call it, um, just to let them know you're thinking of them, you're getting ready for the next class. Um, use whatever tool that you've been using, email, blasts, whatever um, you want to do. But it's just letting them know that you're there, um, you know, and again, looking forward to class kind of let them know what you're planning for class, maybe a little teaser. Um, you could send out um, information about um, what's coming up, set an agenda, lay out your plan, perhaps ask them to complete a brief assignment, um, you know, prior to class and bring it. And it could be like a one question poll or have students take turns leading the pre-class check-in. Any way you can let them know that you're there, you're planning, you're involving them. Um, that sort of thing I think is so important before class. And so similarly after class, really helpful to send a shout out to a student who had a particularly great session or, or, or made some particularly amazing progress. Um, send out a brief recap of the session. However you wanna do it, it could be a voice message in WhatsApp. Maybe they could respond via voice message or text. Anything, you know, they could just share something that they've learned during class. Um, it could be on a Padlet, it could be on a Jamboard, it could be on whatever you're using. Um, just to, to briefly recap the, section, the session. And let this recap, just remind them about upcoming classwork that's due, um, remind them about your virtual office hours or your in-person office hours um, or any other class happenings. I think that that's, it's a nice way to, um, you know, to, to include other things that might be happening, interesting community events you've heard about, anything that you want to include in your recap, just so that again, you're giving them that additional touch and remind them about when your next meeting is and, and how much you can't wait to see them again. And this structure and communication um, is just going to make such um, a difference, I think, to students. And it's, it's reliable and dependable and comforting and reduces anxiety and everybody knows where where they're at in your class. Oh, so that is a lot of information. Um, I, are there any other questions? I'm just trying to, I'm gonna take a quick peek at chat. Um, I'm intending to take a quick peek at chat. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, oh yes, the 40 minutes in the Zoom session, right. Um, the 40 minutes is really um, for, so in a one-on-one -on -one via Zoom, the 40 minutes um, is really, my understanding is that that's for th um, above three participants. Um, so the question is that I can only have 40 minutes in one Zoom um, session. Uh, and you have to pay extra to upgrade. So with Zoom, if it's a one-on-one -on -one meeting, you have unlimited time. Um, if you have over three participants, yes, you have that 40 minute um, limitation. And honestly, oftentimes what I'll do um, when when I had that account is we just leave the room and come back. And it sounds a little cumbersome, but you include the link, um, you know, and, and people can come back. There's really um, no way to get around that with Zoom. Um, and thank you. Yet Darla said that she had the Google Voice phone number. Love that. Right. So you can have a Google Voice, voice phone number um, that students are allowed to text you. Um, and e that's great. That's another really great tool that I know a lot of, of um, people has, have used. And <laughs> Marina saying 40 minute Zoom is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, you've just about gotten everybody settled in and your time is up. Um, but I think, um, as Darla said, a lot of people started with that 40 minutes and saw the saw it's worth investing. But, um, you know, for an individual, <coughs> excuse me, um, to be able to, um, yeah, to, to just, that's what we've done is just sent the link again. Um, let's see. Can I tell you how to use WhatsApp? Paul is asking. Um, you know what is I do have on our Sabe's <laughs> on our Sabe's um, website in our ESOL, and I'll look for it at the end. Please remind me, Paula. Um, we have a couple of videos of some sessions that we had last year about setting up WhatsApp, how to get it on your phone, how to get it on your computer, and all of the different functionality. So um, do remind me at the end to give you the link to our, our video library and I can provide some information on, on WhatsApp there. Um, 
I just want to make sure that I got everything. Uh, yes, learning Donna, learning how to use WhatsApp. I do feel like I should get a commission from them because I just, I really do, I, I do like it. And Google Meets is another great thing, no time limit. But I do believe, Tamara, they have a per person limit, don't they? You can only have X number of people on at a time. I remember hearing that at one point. Um, right, okay. I'm just quickly, okay, thanks for the reminder of the video library. Yep, on Zoom, um, dot, uh, excuse me, on sabes.org. All right, yes, and that's a great, Patty, that's a fabulous um, reminder, a tip there. If you use WhatsApp, students are, are gonna know your phone number, some people don't care, and but a workaround for that is Google Voice, absolutely. I've had that, a lot of people ask questions about that. Very nice. Um, and Julie's asking in her program, we have orientations throughout the year and get new students every two to three months. So any suggestions on developing a syllabus? Um, and I think that that's a really great question. And that's one of the, um, the things as I'm talking about chunking your material out. So that may be, um, we do have the same, we have managed enrollment, many of our programs here in Massachusetts. So we're either adding, we added uh, kind of regular times during the course of the year. Um, and so a lot of our programs will set their units for, for those chunks of time. So if it's a six or an eight or a 12 week period, they'll have one or two thematic units that fit within that time period and that will be the syllabus. So they may have four different syllabi over the course of the year but they um, will be different based on the units that are being covered. Um, and so all of the information can stay the same in terms of your contact and the communication plan and all of that good stuff. But what will change is the content and, and the unit that you're working on during that time. So I think that's how um, the programs that I work with um, um, have gone. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm over time, good gravy. And I haven't even talked about delivery yet. I told you that I got too talky during these things. I'm so sorry. I certainly understand if people need to get going. Um, I'm just gonna zip through our last couple of, of slides here talking about delivery. Um, and again, my apologies, I hate running over time. Um, so the synchronous sessions, these are just really when you're together. Um, you know, where, where you're either in Zoom or Google Hangouts, WhatsApp, Skype, Blackboard, all of those different ways that you can host and deliver your content synchronously um, in real time with your students. Um, when you're work, talking about delivery, talking about these session norms is really important. Um, we all have session norms that we have in our in-person classes. And so you'll just notice here that there might be a couple of different ones. Arriving a few minutes early to test equipment, um, our students, you know, uh, making sure that students are prepared for class. And what does that mean? Um, being ready to participate in an in-person class doesn't mean having a camera and mic, but that's ready to participate in a synchronous session. So many of the, the session norms are the same um in in person versus synchronous with some minor modifications and you just want to make sure that students are aware of, of those um, as, as you talk about delivery um, being on time is really important and silencing your mic is very important um, during synchronous sessions so that there's no background noise um, getting there a little bit early to test equipment is very helpful being ready and to, to participate actively during sessions um, and then, you know, always that reminder that, hello, people can see what's happening behind you. And I think we've all had those embarrassing moments <laughs> that have taken place with, um, with students who forget that uh, everybody can see what's happening in their background if they don't have a virtual background. And really, again, I'm sorry that I'm having to rush through this, but the preparation is really the key. And so I just had a couple of tips for teachers. Um, really practicing um, all the time is, is helpful. Being familiar with the tools you're going to use, the technology you're going to use, um, be, being ready with helping your students troubleshoot. Um, arriving at the session, as I mentioned, so that you can greet students. It's always nice to have that nice um, friendly face when, when you sign into a session. 
Um, you know, other tips include starting and ending the session on time, which I'm miserably failing at today. And again, my sincere apologies. It's just, um, I, I knew I get too talky because I just love this stuff. Um, always start with an agenda for the session um, and try to stick to that, which again, I did not model well today. Um, use visuals or screenshots whenever possible um, so that it just keeps things interesting and engaging for your learners. Um, slow down your speech. Um, that's a really, really hard one. Um, and I, I think we all struggle with that, but that's really important. Uh, we're never sure of the quality of a student's um, headphones or computer audio. So, so trying to be aware of speaking slowly and giving students time to digest information is really important. Um, checking for comprehension frequently um, is also really important. Um, are, they, are they keeping up with you? Is there something that they can do um, you know, a fist to five, a thumbs up, a nod, uh, any way that you want to quickly check for comprehension as you're going. And you can create those nonverbal indicators if a student requires clarification. I, I use the Zoom, um, the Zoom indicators here where they can raise their hand or give you a thumbs up or down, go slower. You can ask if people are, are catching on. Um, and in Zoom, if they click the yes or no, you only see that in the participant panel as the host. So if you if there's somebody who might be a little hesitant to say, oh, I you know don't understand, if they use that feature, they can let you know without necessarily um, broadcasting to the class. Um, or they can simply message you in chat. Um, and again, just did I mention being prepared? I think I probably have. Um, that preparation just of, of yourself just really sets the tone for your sessions with students. Um, be clear on timelines. I think that's really important. Instead of saying, okay, everybody respond in chat, let them know we're gonna have a minute to respond in chat, or we're gonna go into breakout rooms and we're gonna have 10 minutes and then you're gonna come back. And I think that that's really important. Um, you know, then they can let you know they need more time or you can offer more time or check in to see if they need more time. But I think being clear on those timelines gives students the opportunity to, um, to prepare um, for, we've all been in the, in the rooms where people have, you know, um, you're jolted out of the room and you're like, oh geez, I had no idea how long that was gonna go. Um, keeping an eye on chat is really important. Um, really helpful in this too is sometimes asking a student to monitor chat for you. That's really worked well for me a couple of times. Um, assigning a volunteer to, you know, please just let me know if I if there are any questions so that I'm sure not to miss them. Um, being okay with silence is super hard in this environment. Um, but you really got to be okay with it as students are absorbing and thinking and, um, and that sort of thing. Um, and keeping an eye on body language is also really important um, for you, both you and your, <laughs> your students. So just remember if you're, you know, um, if, if you're struggling to stay awake or if you're, you know, drooping at the computer or your students are gonna pick up on that and the same um, with them. So again, you're modeling, you know, interest and engagement um, with your learners. Um, keep it sweet and simple, uh, really important. Um, you can add complexity down the road when you and your students are ready and really basically just be your own funny, witty, sensitive, aware, smart self. Bring that to the classroom. Your students will see that you're bringing that to the classroom. Um, encourage them to bring themselves to the classroom and really that community is going to develop. Um, it, it really will. Um, it, it's just, just having that confidence and digging deep into all the tools in your toolbox for that. Um, and finally, I, and I promise I'm letting you all go now, um, think about by now, oh my gosh, we've attended 7 million virtual sessions. There's some that we recall because they were fabulous. They were engaging and they were info packed and they were even fun. And then there were those that were none of those things. So think about those sessions that you've attended and which made those positive impressions on you. Um, why was that? What was it about the session that, it, that engaged you, that made it interesting, that made you say, hey, that was really worth an hour of my time? What stood out and what can you emulate to strengthen your own practices? Um, so again, we're just back to the three pillars. 
um, the buckets that you can, can put your course delivery in and you really will find success if you structure, communicate and deliver um, using these, those couple of tools. Um, so I'm gonna skip the wrap up um, and I wanna thank you all so, so, so very much for spending this time with me this afternoon. I again apologize for running over. Thank you for those of you who are able to stay behind um, and listen to me go on. I'm here if you have any questions and are interested in staying um, on any longer. I do believe that you're gonna be provided with this PowerPoint and on it is um, the, re the references that I used, um, some of the, uh, the research and the, the, um, the syllabus information that, that's at the very bottom. So I'm gonna stop talking and thank you all very much. And I'm gonna take a look at chat. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen too. Sorry, James. Um. <laughs> that's all right. You're doing awesome. That was a great presentation. I promised I wasn't going to do that, and I did it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so many people stayed on, so I don't think anybody minded. It was that was a wonderful presentation, very Great. well done. I, um, I already launched the poll, so I appreciate everybody that uh, participated in that poll. And by the results, it was an excellent webinar. Um, I want to thank Burlington English again and Robert Breitbart for sponsoring uh, today. And Kate, thank you again so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Um, if you want to take another minute to check through the chat just to make sure there's nothing unanswered, but it looks like people are, are signing off. So thanks, everybody. I hope everybody has a wonderful day and a great rest of the week. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. And as a reminder, just to reiterate what Kate said, the, the materials will be posted on coave.org along with the replay of this webinar uh, within 24 hours of the completion of it today. Great, I think we got all and the questions. with that, I will sign off. All right, all right. Bye-bye, so everybody. Thank you. Take care, bye-bye.